And so for me, the psychedelics <coughs> play a relatively small role because in a way, the persecution and prosecution of people for the psychedelics pales compared to what's going on with marijuana and heroin and cocaine and all these other things. Um, that said, why am I here? Well, first, I have a personal interest in ayahuasca and in the plant psychedelics, and they have played a beneficial role in my own life. The second reason is that any time I see people being targeted and punished by the state because of the substance they are putting in their body, I regard that as a proper area to focus the energies of drug policy reform. And this is a group here, and many of you have been through that experience. And so rolling back the role of the state, and especially its criminalizing roles, is a fundamental mission for me and my organization and the growing drug policy reform movement. Now, it's also the case that in building a political movement to end the war on drugs, one needs to build both alliances and consciousness among the varied individuals and leaders and groups and organizations and uh, officials and what have you who focus on just one aspect of this struggle. Right? There are people who focus just on the issue to make marijuana legal for medicine and others to legalize hemp for agricultural and hemp purposes and others to end marijuana prohibition entirely and others to reduce the racial injustice of the drug war in my country and many others, and others to reduce incarceration, and others to deal with the environmental consequences of the drug war, and others to reduce the harms of the drug war on people who inject drugs, and others who focus on trying to educate in new ways, and others who fight for cognitive liberty. All of these different groups, and many of the people in these groups, focus <laughs> just on the one piece that they're working on. And sometimes their success in moving forward to legalize medical marijuana depends upon disassociating themselves from everything else. The effort to legalize one psychedelic, or let's say, or the one church, moves forward in part by separating itself from the broader drug policy reform movement. To move forward on the racial justice aspect by dissociating itself. And that is sometimes tactically necessary. But in building a movement, what's most important is that people working in any one area, even if their focus, their public focus, the passion is on that specific area, that they at least share the broader consciousness about the need to end the war on drugs and that they recognize that victory in their one area will not lead to the world that we all need to fight for. Now, for this group here, for all of you who are brought together because of a special relationship or interest with ayahuasca, well, we're here because we don't like, and one reason we're here is because we don't like what the state is doing, the criminalization, the stigmatization, the demonization of that, right? We're here in part because we recognize that there are principles of cognitive liberty that are involved. But I'm also here to appeal to you not to segregate yourselves, at least in your own consciousness, from this broader effort to end the war on drugs. It's to understand that cognitive liberty should not apply just to the most elevated of the substances, to, to, to ayahuasca or others that we put in that category, but that ultimately, that principle needs to apply to all substances, even the ones that we look down on as being associated with degradation and people we may not associate with. It's understanding. Oh, oh. That, yes, you and I may agree that ayahuasca is elevated and is a special thing, not just the drug, the plant, but the context in which it's used. But I can point to you a book called Opium and the Romantic Imagination about the wonderful writers who wrote wonderful, famous books under the influence of opium. Or a book called The Thirsty Muse, about the wonderful books written under the influence of alcohol. Or a book called Cigarettes Are Sublime. <laughs> I 
would wager that half the great books written between 1930 and 2000 were written under the influence of that most powerful of substances, nicotine. We know that cannabis has got religious roles and therapeutic roles and all sorts of other roles, right? We know that for some people their mental illness untreated drives their artistic creativity and that for other people antidepressants is the thing that allows them to function and be productive. So we have to beware of having some sense of ayahuasca supremacy, of ayahuasca exceptionalism, even if we live and breathe ayahuasca exceptionalism, not to impose those values, not to demonize the others because <coughs> of our own special experience. And recognizing, because all of us here live with the experience of having to worry about the state and its powers to prosecute and persecute, we all therefore should have that extra element of empathy for people using other synthetic and plant-based chemicals and substances to alter their consciousness for better or for worse and being persecuted five and ten and a hundred times more harshly because of that.